Migration is uh, transformation. A transformation that uh, involves uh, those uh, who leave uh, their land, uh, but also the world uh, that uh, welcomes uh, them. And also the world from which uh, the emigrants come. We could say that uh, the migration process uh, goes in two directions, to the new world and from the new world. This is uh, the meaning of the exhibition uh, that we have uh, downstairs. Like uh, the photographies that uh, the emigrants send home, like the products they ask for, feeding uh, the industries of their homeland. This complexity, I hope, is uh, represented in the diversity of voices that today greet the inauguration of Pride and Memory exhibition. And the first voice belongs to the Italian ambassador in Washington, Mariangela Zappia. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, I wish first of all to congratulate the Italian Cultural Institute in New York and its many partners for the original project Orgoglio e Memoria, Pride and Memory, a one-of-a-kind exhibition dedicated to the story of Italian immigration to the Americas. I hope this interactive exhibition will help the visitors to develop a new, more comprehensive perspective of one of the largest voluntary migrations in documented history. Pride and Memory tells the rich and complex story of the Italian immigrants, a story of dreams, tragedy, and triumph. It is actually impossible to encapsulate the full dimension of the Italian migration to the US in a single exhibition. However, the collection of objects, letters, documents, including many of an Italian diplomat, Adolfo Rossi, contributes remarkably in highlighting Italian footprints in the past and present of the American continent. Italians played a significant role throughout the history of North and South America, profoundly influencing and shaping their development. On the one hand, the immigrants integrated into their new countries, adapting to the new context. On the other, they themselves were agents of change, becoming innovators and leading figures of the society that hosted them. I wish to recognize and thank the various Italian-American associations involved in this project for their support. The National Italian-American Foundation, whose participation perfectly fits in the Italian diaspora team of its next gala in Washington in October. The Columbus Foundation, the Italian-American Museum, the National Immigration Museum of Ellis Island, and the National Museum of Italian Emigration of Genova. Thank you all for your invaluable contribution to this initiative promoted by the Italian Institute of Culture under the direction of Professor Fabio Finotti. Cultural diplomacy remains at the heart of Italy's presence around the world. Exhibits like Orgoglio e Memoria are a key component of our mission to keep memory alive while continuing to promote today's Italy and the fundamental friendship with the US. Thank you all. Um, there, there have been uh, many different exhibits in, on um, uh, Italian migration, broadly speaking, Italian migration to the US. And, you know, approaching the, uh, tackling the issue, the phenomenon of migration from very many different angles. Uh, but I think it's never enough. And I really praise this initiative because, uh, uh, first of all, it's tackling the uh, uh, experience, historical experience of migration uh, from southern Italy to the US, again, in, in from very many different perspectives, starting with the socioeconomic conditions in the 19th centuries, which after the unification of Italy kind of explain historically the wave, the first wave of migration, getting to the more personal stories of, you know, the journey the first journey by boat uh, to the United States, uh, focusing then on an issue which sometimes is uh, maybe overlooked, but we used to study in school, the key importance of remittances by migrants 
for the development of Italy uh, in, in the last century. And, uh, and getting to finally through the you know, big challenge of integration to the roots, very roots of the main in Italy, which were laid here by Italians or migrants of previous generations. So it's very multifaceted, very varied, and uh, in this respect, uh, uh, very, very uh, interesting and praiseworthy exhibit. But what I like more about this exhibit and this initiative is the very notion of memory and pride. Memory, which we, we need to cherish, of course, and pride, which is a consequence of this memory. The moment we know, we learn about the story of hard work, sacrifices, discrimination also, and then integration, success, and American dreams, fulfillment of the Italians in America, we understand that pride. And again, you might have heard a lot here. We have heard a lot in Italy, but it's never enough. Uh, when I came here, and in two years I've learned a lot from the Italian-American community that I thought I knew coming from Italy, but I did definitely know. Um, I learned a, a motto that I always repeat, uh, which is very much about Italian-Americans, uh, which is, uh, we discover it, we name it, and we build it, which is considered by other communities like uh, a little bit of an exaggeration, uh, uh, hyperbolic. But the essence of this message, particularly in New York City, is so fraught with truth, let's be honest. I mean. I was reading a paper a few months ago saying that between the end of 19th century and the beginning of the 20, 80 to 90 percent of workers in the construction area in New York City were of Italian or were Italian section or Italian origins, 80 to 90 percent. And you very much know that uh, the let's say the, the skyline of, of Manhattan hasn't changed that much after World War II. So we can uh, seriously, seriously say that uh, this city has been built by Italian workers. And I want to mention here also the latest proclamation by uh, President Biden and on the occasion of the Columbus Day last year, where he really acknowledged the contribution of the Italians to uh, the wealth, the uh, success, uh, the prosperity of the United States. There again, it's not only about uh, building, it's about the very socio-economic backbone of this country. And it's clear, New York City, the Italian uh, uh, trace is stronger and bigger than elsewhere, but you can find Italians and Italian uh, creation all over the United States, uh, from the West Coast to the uh, Midwest, uh, to New Orleans, which actually was the very first destination for Sicilians uh, in the 19th century. So I want to conclude here by stressing something that I really believe in, is that it's very important to continue focusing on history of migration. And you know, learning is never enough, as I said. And uh, activities and exhibits like uh, that today are very, very crucial to that. But to me, it's a, maybe even more important today, make better known in Italy, single individual stories of success from the beginning, from the ancestors' sacrifices to their children and grandchildren' um, success. Because this is something that probably in Italy we tend to discount or to ignore, take for granted. But that when you come here, you really understand and, and praise and deeply respect. Thank you all. Thank you, Consul General, because uh, you really catch the, the meaning uh, of uh, this uh, exhibition, which is uh, knowledge uh, on one side, emotion on the other side. And pride is the pride for the past, but also the source uh, of inspiration for the future. 
so uh, this is true that uh, uh, Italians uh, should know better what uh, they did uh, abroad. Uh, I am very happy also to acknowledge uh, the uh, presence uh, of uh, Vice Consul Cesare Bieller, Riccardo Cursi, Marta Mammana, Honorevole uh, Christian Di Sanzo, and then uh, of uh, Dominique Critelli, 1921, uh, he is seated there, and uh, he was a, it, an Italian. who fight for freedom in World War II with the American. <laughs> I'm very happy now to introduce Noel Latef, who is a, a, a friend, but also will be able to give a very wide horizon to our exhibition beyond uh, Italy, but focusing on Italy. Thank you very much, Noel. He is uh, the president of a foreign policy association. Well, I'm very honored uh, to be invited uh, to this uh, very important uh, gathering, and uh, as I was listening to Consul General Fabrizio Di Michele, uh, when he reminded us of the role that uh, people from Italy, particularly on the construction side of New York, uh, I could uh, only think of my uh, headquarters building. For nine years, I was uh, with the Bowery Savings Bank at 110 East 42nd Street, uh, now Cipriani, quite appropriately. And uh, that banking floor uh, was just magnificent and it was constructed by artisans from Italy. So let me get to my prepared remarks. Um, over the centuries, immigrants from Italy have brought immeasurable contributions to the fabric of American life. Across all sectors, they have been at the forefront of their fields of endeavor, improving American society. I think of St. Francis Cabrini, better known as Mother Cabrini, who came to New York City in 1889 with the mission of helping the impoverished through charitable work. Her dedication to her faith and to social justice led her to establish 67 institutions including schools, hospitals, and orphanages. For her contribution to her new homeland, she was canonized by Pope Pius XII in 1946. I think of Amadeo Giannini, founder of the San Francisco-based Bank of Italy, which would later become the Bank of America, the world's largest commercial bank by the 1930s. Giannini was known as one of the first financiers to make loans to middle-class Americans. His support and vision financed the growth of the motion picture industry in Hollywood and the expansion of agriculture in Central and Northern California, today the source of much of our fresh produce in the United States. On a more personal note, I think of Guido Calabresi, I had the privilege of being his student when he was the Sterling Professor of Law at Yale Law School, having served previously as Dean of the Law School. To be in class with Professor Calabresi was an electrifying experience, for he truly possessed the joy of teaching. And while he was intellectually fierce as a person, he conveyed great warmth and interest in his students. He currently serves as a senior judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Judge Calabresi has led a life dedicated to jurisprudence. His scholarship is evidenced in many publications over the years, one of the most compelling of which is entitled Tragic Choices, a pioneering work at the intersection of law and economics a field in which Judge Calabresi was a trailblazer. In addition to being one of his generation's finest legal scholars, 
Judge Calabresi embodies many of the greatest cultural attributes of Italy. His mother was a Finzi Contini, and from her he inherited a love of opera, specifically Verdi and Puccini. Parenthetically, he distinguished his love of opera from Justice Scalia's, because Justice Scalia was partial to Wagner. <clears throat> the Garden of the Finzi Contini's, one of my favorite films, while a fictional account, evokes the beauty of the gardens of Italy and reminds us of the time-honored advice, when the world ceases and wearies to satisfy, when the world wearies and ceases to satisfy, there's always the garden. What I can safely conclude from observing close up individuals like Guido Calabresi and other educators of Italian heritage, like Joseph Pastorino, my favorite teacher in high school, who taught American history, is that they wrestled with few questions of unresolved identity. Opera, pasta, Roma are powerful touchstones, whether as humanitarians, financiers, scientists, legal scholars, or as businessmen, and we have Rocco Camiso with us today, to name just a few professions, Americans of Italian heritage have contributed greatly to our advancement as a nation. In politics, they have strengthened our society and our democracy. Of course, they share in the universality of the immigrant experience here in the United States, an experience rooted in the belief that with hard work and perseverance, one can find opportunity and achieve success. In this regard, I am reminded of our chairman at the Foreign Policy Association, Henry Fernandez. Henry came to this country as a 17-year-old, not from Italy, but from Nicaragua. He spoke no English. By his own admission, his teachers at Georgetown University had a hard time understanding him. Today, he sits on the board of Stanford University, and last weekend, he delivered the commencement speech at Stanford's Graduate Business School, his alma mater, and reflected on his three false starts in business, which have long since been eclipsed by his stunning success on the Wall Street firm of MSCI Global that he has led for the past three decades. Henry emphasized in his speech the importance of optimism and self-confidence. And in his words, you have to discover the magic of aligning your skills and connecting them with your purpose and your vision of the future. In many ways, Henry could have been speaking to the immigrant experience of each of the individuals I have referenced today. Their lives are compelling reminders of the ingenuity, creativity, and indeed genius that are synonymous with the rich culture of Italy. To Italy and to her wonderful people, we owe a great debt of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. And uh, now I'm happy to welcome uh, uh, the just re-elected Vice Secretary of the General Council of Italians Abroad, Silvana Mangione. As usual, out of the very tall podia, <laughs> the short ladies need to stay at the side. Uh, the General Council of Italians Abroad is an international organization created by a law of the Italian Parliament, and I'm delighted that today we have the opportunity to meet one of the elected congressmen, elected abroad to represent all of us in uh, uh, North America, North and Central America, the Honorable uh, Christian Di Santo. I want, yes. <laughs> Our president is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, or Secretary of State, if you prefer. We come from about 20 countries. We are elected. Our main duty is to work with, when possible, and fight against, when not possible, the Italian government and the Italian parliament in order to protect all of you and in order to have the laws passed that we need to have 
so that our Italian communities throughout the world can keep thriving and growing and being full of pride and full of memories. Pride and memories are parts of our lives. Uh, very few people know that the first Italians who arrived in the United States were the Valdesians. They had been thrown out of Italy at the end of the 17th century, and then they went to the Netherlands, and then the, land, the Netherlands threw them out, and they came over and created the very first Italian association in the United States of America. And then Lorenzo da Ponte followed about a century later, and he created the first opera theater. And on top of that, the first Italian course teaching Italian to people at Columbia University. Back to us. Truly, uh, it is an enormous task. I represent all of you, and I'm delighted to represent all of you as Deputy Secretary General for the English-speaking non-European countries, that is to say Australia, Canada, South Africa, and the United States of America, the most important for me. Um, Consiglio Generale degli Italiani all'estero has a, an agreement with the museum in Genoa, and we will hear tonight from the museum in Genoa, and we are ready to prepare for a huge conference. We need to meet all of us in Italy and sit down and talk together and see what we can do together so that our pride keeps growing, but more importantly, all the different generations that have been following one another and the new generations and the new mobility and the new uh, uh, immigration in the United States and throughout the world can start talking together without separation. We are all the same people, the same people loving the same things, trying to achieve the same things. And therefore, we need to talk to learn from one another, to learn what the history that you were so beautifully explaining to all of us before. What history we have behind our back and what and which history we can keep creating for the future. Pride means knowing who we are and how important we are on the planet because of our capability of creating culture, beauty, love and friendship among the peoples. We always forget how good we are, how important we are, how strong we are, how creative we are, and how much we can still do if we keep getting more and more together. And for this, I thank enormously the director of the Italian Institute of Culture for hosting this wonderful thing today, and our marvelous Consul General, who has been opening the Consulate General to everybody so that people from different venues could talk together, um, people of Italian descent from different venues could talk together and could build a future even better than the one that we are living now after so many most unpleasant things in the last few years and so many most unpleasant things going on throughout the world. <clears throat> we need to recognize what we built and we need to recognize what we still need to build because Italy is creative, Italy is great, Italy must be recognized again, Italy must be met, must be visited again. We have Turismo delle Radici, that is one wonderful project, and, uh, tourism that brings back to find where you came from or where your family came from and how many years ago and what is happening in between. We need to recognize that uh, Italians in the United States have taken their place of honor and we can keep doing it in any venue of life. That is our promise through the memories for the pride that we might launch again. Thank you.
And uh, another very important link between Italy and the Italian communities abroad, uh, which is a part of the ex exhibition actually, because Adolfo Rossi, who was a great journalist, was also uh, the representative, the diplomatic representative of, the, of Italians in Buenos Aires. Uh, another important institution is uh, Comites. Uh, we have uh, our uh, uh, Honorable Lady Sancio, who is uh, uh, the president of the Comites uh, of uh, Houston, and uh, in, uh, um, uh, in the first row I uh, see Barbara Marchandi, who will speak uh, on behalf of the Comites of New York. Welcome. Thank you so much. Good evening, buonasera. As we sit uh, here today, we are filled uh, with a mix uh, of emotion, because for me it's the first time. Uh, excitement, pride, uh, and maybe even a little of nerves, uh, but most of all, uh, we are grateful. I remember coming to the United States uh, full of fear because of uh, how difficult it will be. From having to learn a new language, a new culture, my mind was hovel over the place. I want to start by thankful for Professor Fabio Finotti for his hospitality, and also want to bring um, to bring greeting for the president of the Communist New York and Tri-State, Alessandro Crocco. I've been living in New York for around eight years, and now I've pursued my career in teaching with the support of my husband and my hour for the hour for kids. Moving on, I wanted to give many thanks for the past generation that arrived in America in search of the new home. This important will we all recognize who they are and what they have saved only, not only for themselves, for, but for their children and grandchildren. We have uh, all experienced uh, our own changes, but uh, it uh, all began with uh, our older generation living their homeland, their whole life. And many left their family and the well is uh, in a search for a new home. Without uh, their effort and sacrifice, uh, we would not uh, be able to be here, thanking them. Not uh, only do we owe them uh, of a debit uh, of gratitude for their hard work and uh, perseverance. We always should be recognize uh, their courage and strength. Not everyone uh, can say they have uh, faced uh, such a uh, obstacle for opportunity. Adapting could be, could be difficult, especially for a new culture and society, with the others looking uh, down up them. Despite having to navigate through their own new world, they were committed to their dreams and aspiration, and worked reality hard to achieve them. This doesn't mean every piece, piece of them got replaced by this new society, society, society sorry, they brought along with them their culture, tradition, and values. So let's take a moment to thank all the older generation for being able to set an example and to move Add and the work for a brighter future for everyone. Italian immigration to the USA is not an all in phenomenon of the past. Many Italians, especially young professionals, move to the USA looking for better career opportunity. They also represent Italian excellence in various domains such as medicine, science, art, finance. 
The hope uh, is uh, that there can always uh, be collaboration between the past and the new immigration for the continuity of uh, our wonderful community. We owe it to the new generation and to the future of uh, the new families. This is a quote uh, from Luigi Pirandello in Italian. Prima che tu giudichi la mia vita, il mio passato o il mio carattere. Cammina nei miei panni, percorri il sentiero che ho percorso, vivi il mio dolore, i miei dubbi, la mia paura, il mio dolore e le mie risate. Vivi gli anni che ho vissuto e cadi dove sono caduto io e rialzati come ho fatto io. Ognuno ha la sua storia, solo dopo potrai giudicarmi. Um, I would like uh, to finish uh, with the quote uh, to Winston Churchill. Success uh, is not final. Fake miller is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. And uh, the end, uh, I would like uh, to say we work uh, well together. Thank you. I, I would like to invite uh, John Calvelli, Executive Vice Chairman of NIAF. Good evening, everyone. I, uh, I always remember a quote from Charlie Rangel, the former congressman from New York, who said, um, everything has been said, but not by me. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to just share a couple of thoughts, and I actually, as I was, uh, had an opportunity to get this book, which I don't know if you have, La New York di Adolfo Rossi, and I literally, uh, without, it's a, several, several pages, but I opened it up to this passage, which I wanted to read to you. Um, D'altre parte, vedevo che certi bosses impiegavano numerose squadre di italiani in faticosi lavori, sotterranei e ferroviari, a mercedi bassissime relativamente alla media del mercato, perfino a un dollaro a 25 al giorno, mentre gli stessi operai guidati da capi meno ladri avrebbero potuto guadagnare almeno a dollaro un mezzo a due dollari. Um, you know, the basic is we were screwed here for many, many years. I mean, you know, if you don't speak Italian, fundamentally, Adolfo Rossi was going around and he was seeing uh, Italian workers being... Uh, used and abused uh, by ladri, by, by cheats. And I think as we talk about all the wonderful things that have been done, and I'm looking at Rocco and I'm looking at Carlo and, and the incredible numbers of people that are here. And I, the gentleman from 1921, my father is only 91. He, he would love to meet you. He'd feel young in your presence. Um, but let's not forget the, the challenges and the tragedies and the difficulties that our forefathers uh, faced here. And uh, there was a reference to the Columbus Proclamation. In that proclamation, there's also a reference to the internment of Italian Americans here during World War II, and that 600,000 Italian Americans were deemed enemy aliens. And candidly, as we talk about this period um, of solidarity, as my colleague uh, stated before, that same treatment was done to the Italians in Australia. So as we celebrate memoria, Let's not forget. Let's not forget the challenges. Uh, former Governor Cuomo had a great saying, we stand on the uh, shoulders of giants. And I look at my own family history. I am I'm either the first, second, third, or fourth generation. My great-great-grandfather came here. And uh, he went back. He was a bird of passage. Uh, he came back. My great-grandfather came here, and he died here. My grandfather was an only child. And he, the last thing he wanted was any of his children to come to America. But my father fell in love, and he came to America. And the fact is that that story can be replicated in many ways at everybody in this room. And at the end of the day, what I find most compelling about this is that we are telling our story. Because the internment of Italian Americans, it was called La Storia Segreta. It was called The Secret Story. And I remember Pope Boniface VII when he says, Kitace conferma, he who is silent confirms. 
we cannot be silent. We need to tell our story. We need more programs like this so that we can come together, celebrate, and remember. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, because uh, when uh, you will see the exhibition, every document, every photo is a story. And uh, it's a story that begins, uh, the courage uh, begins with the travel, because uh, there are also the documents of people who were uh, declined in the state, they were sent uh, to Italy again. So it's uh, really, uh, an history that must be narrated, not only uh, studied. And uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, John. Now I would like to invite uh, Josh Amesson of the Italy Foundation Washington. He is uh, the president. Trying to live up to my three minutes because uh, anyone who's heard me speak before, it's usually longer. But I, I took a look at, at the mission here, was to speak about how Americans have changed Italians and how Italians have changed America. So I began thinking about the seven generations that uh, I'm now part of since my grandparents arrived in 1905. Um, what a great day for me to be here because I'm standing here in the footsteps of a 118-year-old organization the Order Sons and Daughters of Italy and America, founded by Dr. Vincenzo Salaro, a Sicilian who came, who was a gynecologist, who started the Sons of Italy with five other people. My roots, as some of you in the room whom I know long, uh, were all from Sicily. Uh, Palermitani e Shakitani. How then did America change them, my grandparents? Well, yes, it did. For, it, for them, they may, became proud Americans first, never getting the opportunity to return to Italy. And we heard it every day as a kid growing up. They wanted to go back, but America was their home. We celebrated flag days, memorial days, and even when my uncles returned from the military in World War II. I'm unsure if they did uh, such back in Italy, but these Italians, they learned to live in a more democratic society, and therefore they change into becoming involved in the community and in the politics of their time. They wanted to participate by voting and having a voice. And even then, my maternal grandfather, Barber, was friends with the then elected folks from downtown Manhattan who traveled to his international barber shop in New York City on 78th Street and 2nd Avenue. But then I began thinking about how the Italians uh, have changed America. Yes, they made our current society more aware of family values, a learning of the Italian language, a respect, many traditions, feasts and festivals that we now live up to, and even bringing their faith and love for the church. Regardless of what church they went to, they always had a belief in God. They were construction workers, blue collar workers, chefs, foods galore, free business enterprise, creativity galore, opera aficionados, artistry and more. It's endless, we heard it before, they built New York City basically, and so they changed the Americas that we know today, far too immeasurable for us to even calculate. I believe that we can carry that tradition with our involvement and love for America in all the posts that we have. I know that I'm trying to do it in the activities that I've lived up to, and I know that you can. So really today is about memories, history, and pride, and we have it all. Thank you. And now I would like to invite uh, uh, Lisa Ackerman, uh, the incredibly active uh, director of the Columbus Citizen Foundation. Well, I, I think exhibitions like this are incredible opportunities, not just to enjoy the exhibition, but to open up a portal into things that we often don't think about. And I think the idea of the cross-pollination between Italy and the United States is a fascinating one because many of us, uh, my mother's family included, came from Sicily uh, in those early days of the 20th century and were part of that workforce and, and part of the success story, the fact that you know, my sister and I had 
few economic worries growing up when my grandparents had been classic immigrant strivers. But I really think that what has opened up a world to me and what I hope I'm doing at Columbus Citizens Foundation and sharing with its members is the excitement that that story is so much more than that story of immigration. It's the story of the fact that there was an Italian signer to the Declaration of Independence. It's the fact that when America came of age at the end of the Industrial Revolution, one of its great achievements was opening up the American Academy in Rome because that idea of being part of a humanist trans, uh, humanist tradition went beyond the Italian American experience. And we just have to look around our streetscape. In Washington DC, the decoration of the Capitol was an Italian, Brumidi. And here in New York City, I'm very fond of pointing out to people that the Picciarilli brothers, who were from Massa in Tuscany, opened up, <laughs> and the, I was just about to say, opened up a stone yard in the Bronx, and they became the most prolific stone carvers. Their name has been forgotten in time, but they were the stone carvers for Daniel Chester French, who's considered the first great American uh, sculptor, but they carved the Lincoln Memorial, the Fireman's Memorial in Riverside Park, the Police Memorial in Lower Manhattan, the Freeze in Rockefeller Center. So echoing that theme about Italians having built, it wasn't just the physical building, it was even the concepts that we were trying to achieve here in the United States. So I'm thrilled about this exhibition. I hope we'll have chances to see it often. And I hope that this is the beginning of a long dialogue about that cross-pollination that continues today. Thank you. I will steal uh, the expression, cross-pollination. <laughs> Thank you very much. Perfect. Um, and now I'd like to invite uh, Angelo Vivolo, president of the Columbus Heritage Coalition. I can't tell you how humbled I am to be here among so many outstanding Italian Americans who I'm very proud to say are friends of mine. Carlo, who's being honored today, who is an incredible friend for many years, and Rocco Camiso. I don't know what we can say about Rocco. He's just an incredible guy, outstanding Italian-American who's done so much, not only for himself, but for all the people that are around him. Uh, Mediacom, all those people that work for him uh, over the years have, had, have been so uh, fortunate, uh, even during the time of COVID. He took care of those people, made sure that they, they had jobs. So I can't say enough about Rocco Camiso. You know, to address uh, the subject of how America changed uh, Italians, uh, one would have to recognize the struggle of all immigrants to assimilate and prosper in this uh, newfound, their newfound home. I'm gonna, this is gonna be a very personal story about my family because that's all I can talk about in terms of what they did coming here from, from Europe. My father arrived in the United States as a teenager with his family from the Bruciano, Italy. He and his family were uh, confronted with the typical prejudice, comments, and uh, difficulties of all newly arrived immigrants. I believe it was their strong belief of who they were as Italians from a rich culture and heritage that they survived and they excelled. After a number of years, uh, my dad's uh, family opened a, a very successful restaurant, an Italian restaurant, uh, in Brooklyn, and it was there for almost 70 years. My dad married the girl next door, who was from Messina. In 1941, that was not so popular. <laughs> uh, but they had a wonderful, wonderful life together. They uh, both experienced the Great Depression and were unable to finish high school because they had to work to help uh, the support their families. Yet, they raised three children who received college degrees, my brother, my sister, and I. We lived above the family's business, and going up, uh, we all worked at the family's restaurant. Uh, there was no job that uh, we did not do as a family member. Uh, that served me well in my later life, as you'll learn later. We uh, learned the principles of hard work, and always with integrity and pride for what we were, what we were doing. For me and my siblings, it was a life learning experience. 
Upon graduation from college, I was a high school teacher in New York City for almost 10 years before I decided to open the first of my five New York City restaurants and history repeated itself. My three children were born and raised above my flagship restaurant, which was a few blocks from here at, and on East 74th Street. And uh, they were raised as Italian Americans. One interesting story is uh, my son, uh, Frank Francesco, named after my dad, when he was in elementary school, they asked him what his ethnicity was. And he said, well, I'm half Italian and I'm half plain. My wife is not Italian, so that's, that's what that was. <laughs> That's a, that's a true story. I attribute my 42 successful years in the restaurant business to my Italian upbringing. I'm often asked by my Italian friends from Italy about the Italian Americans and their tremendous pride in their ethnicity. My answer is that we do not take it for granted that the rich heritage and culture that Italy represents and how proud we are in some way to be a part of it. You can witness the largest celebration in our great Italian heritage and culture in the United States and maybe in the world at the Columbus Citizens Foundation National Columbus Day Parade up Fifth Avenue. I am committed to representing in the best way the great Italian culture and heritage that I have been blessed with. And as many of you tonight, here tonight, I will do my best to have our community acknowledged and celebrated always for its great contributions to America. Thank you. I think we have now two online uh, uh, connections. So the first one with the uh, Presidente Fondazione Museo Nazionale dell'Emigrazione Italiana in uh, Genova. So if we can launch, uh... <laughs> Tamburi is coming later. <laughs> buonasera, buonasera a tutti voi che siete intervenuti a questa mostra che immagino bellissima. Mi dispiace di non essere lì con voi, ma quello che state facendo oggi è uno dei pezzi del puzzle che tutti insieme stiamo costruendo. Un particolare ringraziamento al direttore, a Fabio Finotti, che come tutti gli altri che conducono gli istituti di cultura all'estero fanno un grande lavoro per, come dire, per parlare, come dite nella mostra, del nostro, della nostra memoria e del nostro orgoglio. È una mostra senz'altro importante perché raccoglie materiale importantissimo proveniente da un fondo importante come quello Bonelli e da realtà importante come la cittadella della cultura di Lindinara e si parla di cose importanti si parla anche di personaggi importanti e il tema partendo da Augusto Rossi credo che il tema dei giornalisti italiani al mondo sia un tema importante noi lo stiamo, stiamo cominciando ad affrontarlo perché spesso i nostri emigranti sapevano ciò che avveniva nel, nel loro paese grazie alle tante persone che facevano giornali, anche con strumenti e con mezzi magari un po' come dire, arrangiati, però riuscivano ad avere notizia di quello che succedeva nel proprio paese e quel paese mancava tanto, manca tuttora, pensiamo allora. Non c'erano i nostri mezzi moderni, non c'era il WhatsApp, non c'erano le video telefonate e quel giornale serviva tantissimo. Pertanto ottima l'idea di lavorare su, su Rossi, ottima l'idea e vi ringrazio della Wall of Fame perché ci sono tanti italiani che fanno un lavoro enorme. Noi di recente abbiamo firmato un accordo con Rai Italia, so che lì siete con gli amici di Rai Fiction, ottima anche complimenti l'idea di fare questa immigrazione un po' 2.0, pertanto unire il QR code, la voce di personaggi importanti come quelli di Un posto al sole. E noi con Rai Italia abbiamo firmato un accordo pochi giorni fa che prevede non solo l'installazione di una postazione di Rai Italia in relazione agli emigranti attuali, ma anche una serie di interventi nelle bellissime trasmissioni di Rai Italia che vedono milioni e milioni di nostri connazionali di interventi sul Museo Nazionale delle Migrazioni. Il museo è nato da circa un anno e raccoglie tantissime storie di donne 
eh, uomini italiani a 360 gradi che sono andati via per vari motivi, per obbligo, per cercare una vita migliore, per le leggi razziali e per, per molto altro. Però indicare e cercare, come voi state facendo, anche quelle figure che davvero inorgogliscono il nostro paese è sicuramente importante, stiamo lavorando sulla figura di eh, Amedeo Peter Giannini, che ben conoscete, da quelle parti che tanto ha fatto anche in, in quelle terre. E... Vi voglio dire che il Museo delle Nazionale delle Migrazioni è, il museo, è la casa degli emigranti di ieri, di oggi e degli emigranti di domani. Pertanto ci mettiamo a disposizione sia con i fondi che lì vedete esposti, sia con gli istituti di cultura, con tutti coloro che insomma stanno tracciando questa strada. Noi la scelta che abbiamo fatto è stata proprio quella del coinvolgimento. So che lì con voi ci sono sia il CGE che i Comites e noi abbiamo realizzato più di 50 protocolli di intesa sparsi come il mondo, con i tanti italiani che con orgoglio stanno raccogliendo la propria storia, la stanno divulgando, divulgando anche le, alle nuove generazioni, lo stiamo facendo con una serie di PCTO con gli italodiscendenti sparsi per il mondo. E pertanto quella del Museo del, delle Migrazioni è la vostra casa, siamo a disposizione, complimenti a, tutto, ringrazio, a tutti, ringrazio le autorità per essere presenti e mi auguro di vedervi a Genova il nostro Museo Nazionale a parlare di questi temi che a tutti noi affascinano molto. Grazie, buon lavoro. And now finally we have Anthony Tamburi. A surprise. <laughs> the Dean of the Calandria Institute. Welcome Anthony. The uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you Fabio. Um, I'm assuming you can all hear me okay? Yes? Okay, good. Um, first, first of all, I want to, um, I'm, I'm coming to you, by the way, from, from Rome, Italy, uh, where we are, tomorrow's the last day of our three-week three week Italian diaspora studies summer seminar, which is funded generously by a number of organizations in the room. I'm I'm not going to mention any of them because I'm going to, I would have uh, obviously forget one and then, you know, andiamo in tilt. So I won't, uh, I won't do that, but I want to, you, you will all be hearing from us. Um, this is a wonderful event. It is also uh, uh, something new, I think, that comes to the, uh, um, to the, to the institutes, the Tan Cultural Institutes, and also the Consolatos. I want to uh, just say, I want to congratulate. Fabio Finotti, for all that he has done since he arrived with regard to welcoming, let's say, or, coll or collaborating with the Italian-American uh, world, whether it be the more social uh, association world, whether it be the academic world. And that's really important. And that is really the key for us to be able to move forward. Um, I also want to thank the Consul General because he has been pushing a lot now for language, the study of language, and that too is very important. Um, I agree with everything everyone said. I think that uh, everyone has been mm -hmm. spot on. I would um, uh, underscore the learning of Italian because through the learning of Italian, we can then access those documents first and foremost that then open up the doors to history so that we look at those documents We look at the realia that are part of this exhibition and um, we make sure that we understand fully where we come from, what our history was, what it is, and how we can build on that to create um, the heritage and culture that we all want to preserve. Well, as we speak, the heritage and culture of future generations are going to have to preserve this one. And we have to understand that culture is an ever evolving phenomenon And, um, and, and only events like this can support, um, can support even greater. Um, the, the, I, I, I'm, I'm tickled in a way by this. It, it, it collab, I'm dealing with films here. And one of the films we saw and that we discussed last week was Nuovo Mondo. And I'm, or Golden Door for those of you who don't know the Italian title, and is a wonderfully wistful movie about uh, the process of, emig of emigration and what it means to leave that village. Someone mentioned the trials and tribulations 
of turn of the century, turn of the 19th, 20th century Italy, what it means to live that, leave that village. We now see the reality here of this exhibit, the same thing. Um, someone mentioned um, uh, Alberto Rossi and, and his writings and his documentation of all that went on. Um, we, we need to be more prideful in what we do. Um, we need to show that pride in some real support, whether it is uh, financial, whether it is moral, whether it is opening up space such as this, um, and whether it is supporting. And I, if Paolo Mazzini is still here, I want to say hello to him. We spoke a couple of weeks ago about dealing with the fifth edition of the International Italian Diaspora Conferences, which should take place, and as soon as we know, we'll let you know, which should take place at the end of November, uh, this coming November, in Genova and hopefully also in Rome. So I just wanna um, also, because of all of that, I wanna also, and I forget who said it, but we cannot take anything for granted. S the systems out there are not gonna help us. We have to do it ourselves. And um, I think the what what is going on with the collaboration between the Italian uh, institutions, the Italian Cultural Institute, the Consulate General, th there's there's a bright light at the end of the tunnel, and um, and and I'm happy to be part of this. I'm happy to help in any way, shape, or form that I can as an individual, and that we can at the John D. Calandra Italian American Institute. And with that, I extend a calorosissimo saluto to all of you. I would like also to acknowledge the presence of Professor Antonello Colosimo and uh, uh, Honorevole Nino Fotti, President of the Fondazione Magna Grecia, uh, who could uh, remind us that uh, uh, the greatness of Italy came from migrants arriving from Greek. So uh, Italy is a place of emigrants and immigrants, and the greatness of our civilization in the capacity of mixing different cultures, languages, ethnicity, and even religions. And now I'm uh, uh, happy to introduce uh, a very young uh, uh, colleague, uh, speaking of a university, uh, Matteo Brera, Executive Director of the Center for Italian Studies uh, at Stony Brook uh, University. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Um, congratulations to you for uh, and for the partners and to the partners for um, uh, having put together um, a really, really interesting, uh, so it would appear, we are all waiting to, to see an um, uh, exhibit. Um, I'd just like to say a couple of, uh, of things. First of all, uh, of course, I bring the institutional greetings of um, a very numerous Italian sub-colony, uh, the one of uh, Suffolk County, Long Island, where 43% 43 of the population of the county is still of Italian descent. Uh, and uh, I do it from myself, from uh, the directorship of the center, and also uh, on behalf of Professor uh, Loredana Polizzi, who's here too. Uh, she's the D'Amato Chair in Italian and Italian American Studies. Uh, and of course, on behalf of uh, whole of Stony Brook University. Now, a couple of, uh, just a couple of small remarks about uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the exhibit itself and a couple of things that I think are very innovative. Uh, well, first of all, the 2.0, the immigration 2.0 aspect. I mean, I'm very keen on uh, um, developing um, new ways of looking at immigration and emigration. And I think uh, the, uh, I think resorting to, to media, social media and uh, um, uh, multimedia platforms is a, a great way forward and probably the, the best way forward these days to make inter, um, immigration and the study of it. Uh, an interactive experience, and I think this is uh, um, exactly what this is about, and it's absolutely spot on. And also, another small consideration about uh, what I heard beforehand about, uh, um, you know, pride. Pride is what we are. Uh, memory is also what we are. And I think uh, another way forward, another fantastic way forward to, to study what we are is exactly doing what this is, exhibition is about, uh, namely focusing on the document, on historical document. 
whether it's, uh, um, whether it's uh, through multimedia platforms or directly as scholars, especially when it comes to newspapers, which are particularly dear to me. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a source, an archival source that I've been studying for a while. I think uh, that's the key to understand who we are back to studying the sources to um, really understand the past, to comprehend what's going on today, and to, uh, to see clearer, probably, what the future is in, in check for us. Thank you very much, and thank you again. Yes, now uh, in uh, many events uh, you hear the speakers asking uh, the audience uh, to post everything in the social. Uh, so uh, I will not do the same, but if you want, uh, you are welcome, of course. And uh, speaking of uh, visibility, uh, I have to thank you in particular uh, Luigi Liberti, Patrimonio TV, uh, for his uh, uh, incredible uh, uh, activity. Also, we are going to have uh, uh, some passages in uh, uh, Times uh, Square in order to make uh, even more visible uh, uh, the uh, exhibition. And uh, thanks uh, to Luigi Liberti, we had also this uh, connection with the guy fiction. Uh, there are four actors from the soap opera, uh, A Place in the Sun, who uh, were filmed and uh, through QR code, uh, they will be able to speak uh, about the uh, exhibition where the visitors arrive to the QR code. And they also produced a very short uh, movie that we can uh, uh, see now uh, in order to explain uh, their engagement uh, with the uh, exhibition. L'urlo della sirena tagliava l'aria. La folla si accalcava sul molo per dare l'addio ai parenti. Tutti sventolavano cappelli e fazzoletti. Il bastimento stracarico di emigranti era in procinto di salpare. Sul ponte di prima classe i signori in viaggio di piacere salutavano agitando il braccio assiepati contro la balaustra, mentre dai buchi neri degli oblò spuntavano le teste dei viaggiatori della speranza stipati come acciughe in terza classe. Il piroscafo era lì davanti e lei... Lo fissava dalla banchina. Le eliche di poppa muovevano il mare tutto attorno, mentre la sirena lanciava a tratti un grido soffocato. Anna era lì, disperata e immobile. Sua figlia Emma se ne andava via per sempre e lei non poteva fermarla. L'America e il mare gliela stavano portando via. Il fenomeno migratorio investe il nostro paese sin dagli ultimi anni del Settecento e interessa prevalentemente le regioni del settentrione d'Italia. Solo dopo l'unità si allarga anche al meridione. I migranti partono per cercare fortuna oltreoceano, per provare a migliorare le proprie condizioni economiche e quelle delle famiglie che sono costretti a salutare. La speranza è quella di tornare un giorno e farlo da gran signori. Le madri vedono partire i propri figli chiedendosi se mai li rivedranno. Pregano, pregano per loro affinché il lunghissimo viaggio che li attende non li segni in modo indelebile nel corpo e nello spirito. Si mostrano fiere e fiduciose, ma il cuore, il cuore implode, mentre le mani operose riempiono la famosa valigia di cartone di sapori di casa, nel tentativo di, di accorciare le distanze con l'altra parte del mondo. <totipo> 
Il mito del nuovo mondo accende le speranze. Queen in the rooms. Now I would like to go on uh, asking Luigi Liberti if he is here and not uh, eating a pizza in the other room uh, <laughs> to come here or ask Malina. Ah, uh, okay, no, sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was writing Malina to, okay. Um, so uh, I think this is a, a great idea, uh, speaking uh, uh, of pride and memory, uh, also because it's our idea, uh, of have a prize. This is uh, the first edition of this prize at the Wall uh, of Fame. Uh, we have uh, to award uh, very important people this year, and uh, they will, this will be the first edition of a price that we want to continue the next years. And uh, it's uh, a price that will be given uh, to uh, Italian descendants who represent the pride of the Italian community abroad and uh, with their ability, but also uh, with their capacity of maintaining strong ties with the motherland. And uh, the prize uh, itself is uh, a, a, an emblem uh, of uh, uh, Italian ingenuity and art craft because uh, we have uh, two statues uh, made by Giuseppe Marco Ferrigno Company, a fourth generation family business located in Naples, Italy. Um, they own uh, several shops uh, on Via San Gregorio Armeno, a street known around the world by collectors of nativities. They are made by terracotta with silk clothes and uh, uh, I think uh, glass eyes. Uh, the Ferrigno began making presepi in Naples in 1836. So it's uh, almost uh, 200 years. And the first uh, awarded uh, this year will be Rocco Comisso. Rocco Comisso <laughs> is, uh, a, is uh, an Italian born businessman, the founder, chairman, I will forget uh, a lot of things, but uh, this is just uh, the, uh, some, uh, the chief executive officer of Mediacom, the fifth largest cable television company in the United States. But uh, since 2017, uh, you are also the owner and the chairman of New York Cosmos, and uh, since uh, June 2018, the owner of the Italian football club, Fiorentina. <laughs> so, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I will uh, give you this uh, wonderful statue, which wow. is uh, the award, and uh, uh, Luigi, in the meantime, will put uh, your photo to the wall, will, uh, the, and the photo will be expo exhibited in the exhibition for all the uh, time of the exhibition itself. Because uh, we want to uh, uh, give honor to the past, but also to the present and to the future. Maybe we can uh, do that. Don't put that there. That's gonna fall down. No. Okay. <laughs> it's a... Thank you very much. I'm truly honored, uh, even though that's all they want to do with me these days. Since I'm old, they just want to give me awards. I says, give me youth as opposed to awards, I'll be better off. But anyway, my, my experience is very similar to most people that came here the first time. My family, I came here in 1962. 
when the Barazana Bridge was being built um, with my mother and my two sisters. <clears throat> my father had, had come yet to the US in 1956, and then in 1958, you could, this works, right? And then in 1958, he brought my brother over. My father was a prisoner of war in Africa in the 30s, and uh, in the 40s, I should say, 1940s, and was under the English for five years. And more than anything else in my life, that was my, uh, my strength. Whenever I had problems in persevering, because I know that whatever sacrifices I'm making, my father made way, way much more than me. Came here, and I must admit that except for a few instances, when I went to work for JP Morgan, Chase Manhattan Bank at that time, where I was the only <coughs> corporate uh, officer in the entire bank. Uh, and I saw some prejudices there. America has been phenomenal to me, where I received a lot of breaks, lots of luck came on the way. I came here with two tools. One was my accordion, and the other one was a soccer ball. With the accordion, since I came to New York late, I didn't take the co-op test. And there's a young lady here, did she go home already? Uh, that told me that she lived right next, very close to my, uh, to my high school. Uh, I won a talent scout with the accordion. I used to play the accordion. There were double features at that time in the Bronx, Wakefield Theater. I managed to get in by having the director, the manager of the movie theater, send a letter to, to the principal, says this guy may be a little smart, so why don't you admit it? And they admitted him. I was the only, only Mount St. Michael guy that got into Mount St. Michael without ever taking a test. So I was, that was the first, the first break was coming to America. The second break was the accordion. The third break is when I hustled my way into Columbia University. Even though I didn't play any soccer at Columbia, I managed to find a way of convincing the coach at Columbia to give me a scholarship of room, board, and tuition, which today is about $400,000. Those my, were my two big breaks. From there, naturally, having gone to Columbia with a business degree, a graduate business degree, <coughs> and an engineering degree, opened up doors which led to Chase Manhattan Bank. Later on, I started lending money to the cable business. From there, I went to a company called Cablevision. And then in 1995, after that company got sold to Time Warner, I started my own company, which was Mediacom. And we've been around now for 20, 28 years. Pretty successful. Um, I did not go back to the Bronx to do cable. I went to the Midwest and the Southeast. That's where we have 22 states where we have all our operations. So as I said, very little prejudice and lots of opportunities. This is truly the land of opportunity. And when I made the decision to take a break uh, and go to Italy and buy a soccer team, I thought I was going there not only to bring money, but they would love me, right? But naturally, the team did not do well, and all kinds of cri criticism erupted, you know, with the fan base. But more critically is with the newspapers. So the newspapers did not do a very good job. And boy, boy, did I learn why us, I'm a Calabrese, by the way, a lot of Sicilians, but no Calabrese that I heard of, right? Now I understand full well why the southern Italians had to run away from Italy because the northerners then and today have a huge prejudice towards the southerners, okay? And that's, but that gave us the great opportunity of making something out of ourselves coming from the south. And all of America, 90%, I would say, all comes from south of Naples for the most part, let's say south of Rome. And 
the fact that they started going after me with some pretty slang language. By the way, I'm the only, it's, there's been a lot of American capital that's gone to Italy to, um, to invest in soccer team. I'm the only one of the owners that's gone to Italy that is Italian American. I mean, that was born in Italy, I should say. The only one. So you would think they would treat me a little better than all the other stupid Americans, right? <laughs> But it was the other way around, because they figured, since I come from Italy, from southern Italy, that they could pick on me. But I'm dealing with that. We're talking about here Gazzetta dello Sport, which is the number one sports newspaper in Italy. It's part of Corriere della Sera and so on. And I have a lawsuit, a defamation lawsuit, which is still going on. And so far, the judges have treated me very well. OK? So I, uh, I don't care, I was going to say something else, wherever I've been, as long as you persevere, as long as you feel that you are on the right, then go and fight, and fight for your principles, fight for all the values that your parents gave you, and you'll be a winner. And so far, we are a winner, because even if I lose a game, okay, I've won so much more by gaining respect by the people that I'm helping. I'll give you another tidbit and then I'm gonna let you go. So we have invested a lot of money in Italy, okay? And the people in Florence, they're wonderful, there's some Florentines, absolutely wonderful people, but they're very envious, some of them, all right? I'm not talking about, about I'm talking about 10% of them, not the, not the other 90%, the, the other 90% they love me. So I always like to stick it to them that not since the Medici's has any person come to Italy and invested the money that I've invested in the city of Florence. We're building right now, which should be finished in the next couple months, the most avant-garde unisex sporting center in all of Italy. We'll have the women, the men, the little kids, boys and girls we're going to have over 20 teams practicing in the fields that we're building. It's the biggest, there's nothing like this in America, and it's certainly very few, if any, in Europe. And I'm very proud of the money that's been invested. We're going to open up, hopefully, around the first week in September. It's almost finished, it's taken two and a half years. I deal with all the bureaucracy, all the, and you're all invited to come here. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm not used to this. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I think uh, that uh, I can uh, reassure Mr. Comiso that uh, even uh, northern people are not uh, treated well by newspapers. There is no difference in Italy. If you have a success, you become a target in general. So, uh, and I can give you many examples, one in particular. Uh, and now uh, the, our next uh, award is uh, Carlo Cisura. Uh, I am uh, very happy uh, really about uh, uh, this choice because uh, he is now pre president and CEO of a New York Building Congress, uh, but uh, he was the president and CEO of the Brooklyn uh, Chamber of Commerce. Under his uh, leadership, uh, the chamber became one of the New York's largest business advocacy and uh, economic development organization. He is also the chair of the Federation of Italian American Organizations, uh, where he is uh, spearheaded at the building of the new Italian cultural and community center in uh, Brooklyn. And uh, I uh, would like to uh, ask him to uh, step forward and receive the Wall of Fame, which is, uh, if I can have it, thank you. 
Gabi, sorry, <laughs> which is uh, a, an emblem of uh, uh, abundance. Beautiful. Of course, abundance live and Thank you very much. Good evening. Buonasera. Anybody here? Buonasera? Okay, that's better. When you're from Brooklyn and you're Italian, we're, we're like excited people. Um, although we've heard from a lot of speeches, uh, I decided that I'm going to speak as long as all of the speakers before me all together. So you're here for a while. No, I promise I won't. Um, thank you to, uh, to this wonderful place that we're in. L'Istituto di Cultura, it's beautiful, and thank you for having us. Luigi, grazie della, della tua gentilezza, come sempre. Um, I, I'm just going to say a few things. First of all, Rocco, it's an honor to be honored with you. Now, you did say there are many Sicilians here, and we know that you are Calabrese. I will say this. I used to think Sicily had the most beautiful beaches in the world, but then I went to Gioiosa Ionica, and you have better beaches in the Ionian coast than we do in Sicily, I have to say. Now, now I will promise you one thing, Rocco, I promise you. When I go home tonight, I'm going to take my Milan jacket and I'm going to throw it out. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, going to, I'm going to find somehow a nice Fiorentina jacket that I will wear proudly when I go out and about. I swear to you, I promise. Um, so like many of you, uh, immigration, my, my parents, my mother's here tonight, came from Sicily in the late 60s. And we were part of, like Rocco and many of us here, the, the last of the big wave of the Italians that arrived. By the way, this guy has been up here all night. It's just very <laughs> fun. Um, so we were part of that last 1950s, 1960s, early 1970s wave of Italians. Um, and they were different than the ones who came 50 years, 80 years, 100 years before. And in many ways, they built on the successes of the generations before. And tonight we talked a lot about the history and the past. And, and that's very important because that shapes who we are. But I want to talk for a minute about the future, because if we don't talk about the future, then I'm not sure who will come to these things in 10, 20, 30 years. Um, you know, when you look at the Italians in the US, uh, we are still the fifth or sixth largest ethnic group in America. Think about that. In New York State, we are the largest ethnic group. In New Jersey, we are the largest ethnic group. In Connecticut, we are the largest. In Massachusetts, we're second. In Rhode Island, we're first. In Pennsylvania, we're second. In New York City, we are the largest white European ethnic group. In Long Island, I, I don't think you spoke about Long Island, we are the largest ethnic group in Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, as John knows better than most. I can go on and on and on. I, I say all of this because imagine, imagine if we acted like we were the largest ethnic group in New York, the largest ethnic group in Pennsylvania. I can go on and on. Imagine if we acted like we had the governor of New York for a decade who was Italian. We had the speaker of the House of Representatives. I don't care about politics, whatever side you're on, who was Italian. Two Supreme Court judges who were Italian. I tell the story that when Antonin Scalia passed away, any other ethnic group would have marched and screamed that that is an Italian seat. It must be filled by an Italian. What did we do? We talked about something else. So while we think about the past and it's glorious and immigrant stories like mine and my mother's and many others, if we don't think about tomorrow, if we don't think about what are we doing, if we don't listen to people like Angelo who yells all the time about focusing, uh, about things like Columbus statues and Columbus Day um, and, and things of that, then what will we be doing when my daughter, who's eight years old, 
wants to come to these things and learn about Italians in 30 years, 40 years from now, what is the past going to be? Oh, we once were. We once had Supreme Court justices. We once had the governor. I don't want to talk about we once had. I want to say, by the way, in the last 20 years, we elected more women Italian Americans across America. We elected more people who are Italian in state houses. We have another Supreme Court judge. Maybe the president of the United States is Italian. Maybe there is another Rocco who starts more media companies and more technology companies. If we don't do that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sure what we're going to do. So all of us tonight, this is wonderful. This is a great honor. But we should all leave here with homework. And the homework is go out and spread the word of being Italian. Go out and spread the word that we are hardworking individuals who have built empires across this country, who have created jobs, who continue to work in education and music and culture and film and, and everything in between, and law and medicine. And let's not forget that in 30 years from now, when we'll all still be alive, by the way, uh, we want to come back and say, in the last 30 years, we had the greatest successes of Italians in the history since the 1800s of Italians. So that has to be our work here tonight. We have to leave here together, unite, and continue to talk about the greatness of this culture, which I would say is the best culture in the world. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>
we know we're all Italians. We know that <laughs> the Italians seem to get something done faster. And I'm here tonight uh, where I have a wonderful friend who invited me here to meet all the Italian people. And uh, I haven't met this many Italian people since I'm in America. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm so happy here amongst everyone. I just want to say a few words. <laughs> I'm a veteran of World War II. I, I spent four years in Germany and uh, <laughs> was in uh, many battles there. And uh, I was a member of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, brigades that uh, had so much to do also with the Utah Beach. We had a terrible thing at Utah Beach. So, and the Battle of the Bulge also. So, I would like to just talk about the, the veterans. We seem to think that the veteran, they have a war, they come home, and it's all over. It's not all over. Now, for the things that's happening in Ukraine, I, we're so, I, 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 I feel, I, I tell you how I feel what's happening there. Uh, demolition all those buildings and killing all those people. And then I get back at the veteran. Now, they didn't have enough people protecting their country. And this is what I'm here for. I like to have more people go into the army and protect these countries, these countries that can't protect themselves, just like they're protecting our country. Really, I wouldn't have been able to be here if we couldn't protect them. So what's happening in Ukraine is, 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 a, dress, is a terrible place. And I, I'm just hoping that we get more people to protect that country, where just one big country says, look, I want this, no, I want it, whether you want to give it to me or not, or whether you sell it to me or not, I want it. Whether I, I tear your place apart or whether I get it like, like uh, in a good way. So, you know, I don't know what's happening there now. I'm not uh, concerned, but I am concerned with more people getting into the, these, uh, these armies where <coughs> they're protecting the people where they live. And I came to this country when I was eight years old. I was an immigrant like everyone else, you know. <laughs> immigrant. And uh, <coughs> I learned the language, and it was a very difficult language, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult. I used to uh, look at the uh, buses passing and uh, two and two and uh, uh, diner and dinner and, uh, you know, these things that used to bother me because in the Italian language, you know, we use the end with a vowel. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I went to school here. I, they put me in the second grade and... Uh, I graduated all the schools up to the, I, I went to, uh, I, had, I did my graduate work at New York University, and uh, <coughs> I did it in education, and I became a teacher. Yeah. I, I also taught in Brooklyn, <laughs> in high school in Brooklyn, uh, the South Shore High School in Brooklyn. And I taught there for 20 years. And I, I retired in 19, I think, 1948. Well, anyway, I had a good time. And uh, I love kids. I love kids. And that's why I, I became a teacher. I love to deal with kids. 
you know, if you could get anything you want out of a kid if, if you just treat the kid right. Just treat him right. Don't think that you're better than him, but treat him the way he wants to be taught, treated. Now, yes. Now, I have something here. I just want to tell you a little bit. We, we like to change the subject because I thought it was important. Uh, I wanted to come through with the Battle of the Bulge because I, 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 I got the air medal there, by the way. And uh, <laughs> there was uh, three or four more big battles that I was in. But this Battle of the Bulge, to me, indicated that we had to have more people protecting our country. Uh, the Battle of the Bulge at that time had three battalions in our division that were stranded. They were surrounded by the Germans. And uh, when I was in the Army, I was a mechanic on two small airplanes. And uh, these two small airplanes were used for observation. Observation. We observed all the enemy and then t radioed down to the artillery, and the artillery would demolish him. So <coughs> it came a time when they were all surrounded by the Germans, and uh, it was bad weather. Our planes, our small planes, couldn't, couldn't continue to fly because of the weather. And the people, the three battalions we had there, were up to, uh, yes, all right, up to their knees in, in uh, mud and snow, and they couldn't do nothing, and they had, they had nothing to, to, to eat, nothing, yes, okay, nothing to eat, and <laughs> we, drew, we uh, uh, had to uh, load those small airplanes with food, ammunition, and we dropped this food and ammunition inside where the Germans had us uh, surrounded. So we dropped everything, we dropped uh, all the uh, cans of food and everything, and I dropped also a carton of cigarettes, you know. <laughs> Boy, they love that. They love that more. So anyway, I want to I want to make this short because I, yeah, this story goes on, and I can tell you a dozen stories. Anyway, after that, we had two or three days, better days. Yes, better days, and and the uh, the sun shone, and our planes came out, and they uh, and they got all the Germans around us. They they were I tell you they they. <laughs> they made the uh, soup out of them, everything, everything outside. So we were able to get in, and we saved those people in Bestone. And this is the Battle of the Bulge. Now I could tell you a million stories, but it takes too long. I want, I, I want to hear people they haven't. So I, I would like to, I would like to just remind you that we need more people in the military. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Here is the picture. I, th I think we need more people like you, not just people. I'm going to leave this. <laughs> Show them the little planes in the back. Thank okay? you. And uh, now I would like to invite the three curators uh, of the uh, exhibition. Uh, um, uh, because uh, we are, ex uh, of course, uh, running out uh, of time. Uh, the exhibition uh, is uh, divided in uh, two different uh, sections. Uh, one uh, is devoted uh, to Naples, uh, and the other one uh, is uh, devoted uh, to uh, uh, the Northern Exhibition. Bonelli the, is uh, the creator and the director of the Muse Museo di Napoli, Collezione Bonelli, and uh, the, the great part of the documents uh, of uh, uh, Naples, coming from Naples, belongs uh, to belong to his uh, collection. I hope that uh, something is done in the future to open a museum in Naples, because we don't have a museum about immigration, and it is strange that uh, the first uh, exhibition of your collection is uh, in New York and not. Uh, uh, in uh, your city. And then we have uh, um, uh, two uh, representatives uh, of the uh, Cittadella um, uh, della Cultura di Lendinara uh, who studied uh, 
ehm, Adolfo Rossi eh, and who helped us to organize uh, this, that part of the exhibition. I would like to invite you, Nicola Gasparetto, direttore della Cittadella, and Francesca Zeggio, assessore alla cultura e pubblica istruzione. Yeah. Invite. So uh, it will be a very short presentation, of course, because uh, everybody is looking forward uh, to uh, visiting uh, the exhibition. But I would like uh, to leave you uh, the floor and if you can say some words. Sì. Allora, uh, io uh, speak uh, Neapolitan and uh, Italian because uh, uh, la, la, ci dovrebbe essere la translate, traduzione. Uh, io la, quello che mi sta a cuore trasmettervi è che quello che vedrete è il frutto, questa mostra è stata realizzata in pochi mesi, ma è il frutto di un lavoro ultra trentennale. Io ho iniziato a recuperare queste testimonianze in età adolescenziale perché c'era il desiderio di far sì che la memoria, la memoria delle nostre comunità, la memoria di quanti hanno desiderato una vita migliore e in molti casi, non sempre, eh, sono riusciti nel loro intento, eh, fosse ricordata. Attraverso i nostri progenitori noi dobbiamo a loro tantissimo perché anche il brand del Made in Italy del quale tanto si parla è nato proprio grazie ai primi emigranti come vedremo dalla mostra. Quindi vedete oggi in qualche modo si, nella terra delle aspirazioni, dei sogni, si realizza un sogno. Diciamo un sogno che è iniziato una trentina d'anni fa, oggi devo dire grazie al professor Finotti e all'amico Luigi Liberti che ha, fatto, ha curato l'organizzazione di questo evento, questa mostra eh, ha trovato coronamento. Quindi per certi aspetti, senza enfasi, è una mostra storica, sia perché ha avuto una lunga gestazione, quello che vedrete non è il frutto di una ricerca, di un'acquisizione di una fondazione, di un'istituzione, ma è un privato cittadino, chi vi parla, che ha dedicato la sua esistenza per il culto della memoria. Quella che vedete esposta è una delle 20 aree tematiche, l'emigrazione, ma ce ne sono altre 19 che danno vita alla più importante, alla più grande raccolta al mondo dedicata a una singola città, l'unica che può vantare ben 20 aree tematiche e questo è il frutto di quasi 40 anni di ricerche e acquisizioni. Grazie. Grazie, eh, io sono Francesca Zeggio e porto i saluti del sindaco Luigi Viaro che io sono qua a rappresentare in nome della città di Lendinara. Per noi è stato un orgoglio grandissimo conoscere il dottor Finotti, l'Istituto di Cultura Italiana all'estero, anche grazie alla dottoressa Beatrice Maria Beatrice Otizi che ci ha eh, diciamo, creato questo collegamento dando a noi la disponibilità e la possibilità di portare in maniera intercontinentale quelle che sono le risorse della nostra città la cultura di un personaggio Adolfo Rossi che è nato eh, diciamo questo percorso dal 2021 in occasione del suo centenario ma che ci ha visto protagonisti nel far emergere quello che gli oggetti esposti e qui ringrazio il dottor Gaetano Bonelli ma anche Luigi Liberti con cui appunto abbiamo stretto questa amicizia nata proprio nel classico stile italiano che è quello di collaborare insieme e di portare fuori eh, quello che è l'Italia. Io oggi ho respirato in questa sala veramente l'orgoglio di una memoria italiana che è ancora viva e che sta continuando a seminare nel mondo persone di successo, ma un successo fatto di persone, di uomini, di donne, ma soprattutto di un orgoglio italiano che sa dare molto al mondo. E in questo ecco il grazie di Adolfo Rossi che ha saputo riportare eh, nella sua espressione giornalistica, oltre che nel suo ruolo di console, veramente l'immagine di un italiano all'estero che sa esserlo nonostante le difficoltà che sono state espresse nonostante le difficoltà che abbiamo sentito che ancora oggi magari potrebbero esserci 
ma che ci accomunano da quello che è l'orgoglio italiano. Quindi io, eh, come dice sempre il mio sindaco, parlo perché ho una squadra dietro che mi ha permesso di essere qua a rappresentare eh, l'Indinara eh, a New York ripercorrendo quelle che sono le tappe del nostro console e giornalista Adolfo Rossi quindi ringrazio uno a uno i miei collaboratori partendo da Chiara Gramegna da Vanessa Incao, Michele Guerra, il collega Assessore Franco Fioravanti e non per ultimo il mio direttore della Biblioteca Cittadella della Cultura eh, di Lendinara che sa veramente esprimere, ricercare e eh, valorizzare quello che è un patrimonio culturale. Non c'è memoria se non c'è orgoglio, non c'è orgoglio se non c'è ecco, eh, personale, quel personale amore di essere italiano questo fa la differenza grazie a tutti vi permetto solo prima di passare la parola ecco, di dare questo che è un, ehm, eh, un omaggio l'immagine del nostro console giornalista Adolfo Rossi è un pensiero fatto da un nostro concittadino Antonello Ferrari e ricordare anche che grazie ad Adolfo Rossi il comune di Lendinara eh, ha ormai da quasi dieci anni eh, bandito diciamo, un premio giornalistico che coinvolge i giovani, un riconoscimento di 3.000 euro diciamo, per chi partecipa a questo premio ma non è tanto il valore economico quanto, e questo lo si fa in collaborazione con l'Università Popolare Hauser di Lendinara, quanto alla valorizzazione dei giovani come è stato detto prima chi ha deciso di fare questa strada è perché ha deciso di poter tornare o restare ma comunque di divulgare l'orgoglio italiano quindi mi permetto di dare al dottor Finotti questo e un omaggio floreale un omaggio floreale fiori, fiori, un omaggio floreale che è qui a Malina prego perché ecco che dovrebbe uscire i fiori il ruolo, il ruolo, sì, eh, dovrebbero passarteli però di fatto, ecco, vieni. No, ecco, voglio un applauso perché è giusto, insomma, ecco, l'accoglienza italiana lei l'ha saputa esprimere con il massimo della sua, della sua gentilezza. Sì, dico, 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 dico due cose, sì. E ringrazio naturalmente per eh, l'occasione di oggi che rappresenta il, il traguardo di un, di un percorso che eh, ho iniziato un anno fa perché l'idea eh, di ehm, far diventare questo patrimonio eh, storico che è il nostro concittadino Adolfo Rossi, personaggio studiato già da diversi anni in diverse occasioni all'Indinara, di farlo però diventare un patrimonio condiviso e soprattutto di riportare le sue parole nel contesto in cui nacquero. Noi siamo, è stato più volte evocato il suo nome oggi, troverete la sala d'ingresso con la mostra che ho, che ho curato, anche nella biblioteca c'è uno spazio a lui dedicato e soprattutto l'incontro con il professor Finotti che ho avuto l'occasione di avere po quasi pochi mesi fa, un anno fa, nell'ottobre dell'anno scorso, è, è, è legato alla nascita di questo libro che ho curato eh, proprio in quell'autunno, quell che nasce dall'idea che avevo già da diversi anni, quella di riprendere queste preziosissime testimonianze, un italiano in America, nel paese dei dollari, ma so, e, so, e a fianco di questo anche i tantissimi contributi di Adolfo Rossi come eh, osservatore del fenomeno dell'immigrazione attraverso i suoi interventi sul progresso italo-americano. Una testata eh, di cui noi conoscevamo l'importanza per lui, ma che abbiamo riscoperto essere una fonte in buona parte ancora inedita per quanto riguarda l'apporto di, di Adolfo stesso. Quindi calare le sue parole e... Mh, nel contesto in cui nacquero, affiancarle all'operazione che ho seguito con il mio staff ehm, in questi mesi, eh, affiancarle le sue parole con le immagini d'epoca, con le immagini della New York di eh, fine ottocento, inizio novecento e le immagini della New York di oggi, quindi muoversi in un dialogo fra epoche diverse iconograficamente e fra epoche diverse attraverso le parole di Adolfo Rossi e le testimonianze che abbiamo raccolto ad esempio dal professor Finotti che ringrazio ancora di cuore. Grazie.
eh, eh, hai, eh, penso che a questo punto continuiamo a parlare in italiano penso che eh, poi eh, ci, la visita eh, della mostra oggi ai curatori presenti quindi se qualcuno vuole chiedere qualcosa si, posso, si può approfondire tra l'altro di Rossi c'è la divisa e c'è anche la spada all'entrata e ne, ci sono eh, belle testimonianze in biblioteca e quindi io ringrazio tutti offrendo due possibilità o la pizza col presecco a questo piano o la mostra al piano sotto.